Hi guys, James at Rampant Lion Reviews again for you today with another beer review. For this one, we are going to stick to Japan and we're going to go to another brewery that I've never tried anything from before. So these guys are another relatively new addition to the Japanese beer scene. From what I understand, they're very experimental and they've got a really quite high output of beer when you have a look at their untapped page as well. But the beer that we're going to have a look at today is a style that I very much enjoy. It's quite old school, I guess we could say as well and I do hope we see a little bit of a revival in this style over the next little while but it also came as a recommendation from one of my regular beer suppliers here in Osaka as well so needless to say I'm really curious to see what this one is going to have in store for us hopefully it's another good beer hopefully it makes for an interesting review and as always I hope that you guys enjoy my take on this one as well so um yeah for this review then we are going to return to she's to Numazu in Shizuoka prefecture which is in the Mount Fuji region of Japan a bit to the south of Tokyo the capital city and we're going to have a look at my first beer from Repubru so this particular beer is called C Square IPA it comes in at 7.5% ABV. This one is a West Coast IPA, and from what I understand, it's an old school sea hop West Coast IPA. But this beer was the recommendation of Rika, who uh, is involved with liquor shop Asakiya in Taishibashi Amaichi in Osaka. It's her and her dad Koji that run that, and they supply a good number of my Japanese beers that I review for you here on the channel. So massive shout out to them, of course. This was the beer that Rika picked out as her favourite one for the moment. So uh, yeah, quite curious to try this and see what it's all about. But make sure you check out the link to their Facebook page in the video description below. Follow them on Instagram as well and you will see all the new beers that they're getting. A great selection of Japanese stuff as well as things from further afield. But yeah, I very often go there and I do recommend that you do as well. But yeah, let's crack on with this one then and see what we have. A new Japanese brewery and an old school Seahawk West Coast IPA. This sounds pretty interesting to me. So so um, yeah, as always with my reviews then, I'll tell you a little bit about the brewery before we taste the beer. If you want to get straight to the tasting though, just fast forward. All the usual links are in the video description below. That's the brewery website, the link to my future reviews that I'll do from Repubru. Very first time I'm trying one of their beers as I mentioned, but there's all the usual social media down there. If you want to see more reviews, do please consider subscribing to the channel. The support you give is massively appreciated. And remember, you can go into the channel homepage and search for beer based on the geography tagging system. Just go to the search bar, put in your hometown, state, county, prefecture, whatever you like, and it should hopefully uh, pop up with some beers that I've reviewed. It depends if I have actually covered things from your local area, of course. But you can also check out beers uh, from the different playlists, and you will find this one in the Japanese playlist, which we'll be getting added to regularly over the next little while. But yeah, let's go on to my brewery notes then to tell you a little bit about Repubru. So, Repubru, as I've mentioned to you already, is based in Numazu in Shizuoka Prefecture here in Japan, and the main man behind this brewery is Shoma Hata, who founded the company back in 2017. So apparently at 18 years old, he was working in an izakaya, you know, a little mini Japanese restaurant, but he thought that brewing shochu or nihonshu, Japanese sake, would be a good career choice, and it was this that prompted him to go and study at the Tokyo College of Biotechnology. But, <coughs> pardon me, but since he reached legal drinking age, he was actually interested in learning more about beer. He drank Koedo quite regularly, who are one of the bigger Japanese craft beer brands, and he also purchased American and Belgian beers quite regularly from Antenna America and the Belgian Beer Japan websites. But during his second year of studies, when he reached 20, which was until... I think about now, the legal alcohol drinking age in Japan, he actually started studying fermentation and it was this that really um, kind of prompted him to look at beer because he was fascinated with the science behind fermentation. But later on in his studies, he found himself gravitating more towards beer and during his third year, he interned at Orache, which is, who sell their beers under the name of Kaze no Tani Beer, but these guys are located in Kanami in Shizuoka. And this was a bit of a shock to him because he was from Kawasaki and this place was just really, really rural. It was about 15 minutes by car from the nearest train station. Um, but um, when he graduated in 2012, he was offered a full-time position and he took it. And during the time that he was working there, he worked under brewmaster Takeshi Kimura, who had studied brewing at the Technical University in Berlin. And he taught Shoma how to brew organically and also how to do his own malting. So this brewery, of course, were very 
unique in Japan to do both organic brewing and for the fact that they made their own malt. But um, the fact that the brewery only had a few kind of regular beers and you know occasional seasonals meant that he felt quite limited. And so he wanted to be more creative. And on top of brewing for these guys, he worked part time in uh, Numazu to save money to open up his own brewery. And apparently, he was very clear with them that when he took the job full time, he wanted to uh, to start up his own. Uh, he wanted to start up his own company. But in February of 2017, Shoma left Orache to create Repubru and he opted to settle in Numazu instead of his hometown of Kawasaki. And a big reason behind doing this was apparently the proximity of the Shizuoka Prefecture Industrial Research Institute. So these guys allow brewers to store yeast at no cost and they also provide assistance in propagating yeast strains as well, which was ideal for what Shoma wanted to do because he wanted to be very, very experimental. And he has, of course, done that over the years but the the rental costs in Shizuoka or Numazu were actually really quite reasonable and he wanted to be located close to a train station so that he would attract a number of visitors but he opened his pub near the Numazu station in April of 2017 but apparently it took a little bit longer than anticipated to get the brewing equipment installed but he finally received his brewing license in September of that year and he started brewing beer the following month and I think the first beer was on tap uh, in November of that year so before that he had the pub open and he was selling guest beers from what I understand but he was initially brewing on a 350 litre system he had a few fermentation tanks and I think he used uh, crowdfunding actually to fund uh, expanding the brew system and also uh, getting more tanks and things in there as well but these days they've also got the slider house near Mishima station as well which has 12 taps and I think at the um, actual brewery tap room it's about 10 or so that they've got but uh, yeah as I said over the years these guys have built a very solid reputation for themselves they've been very experimental as of December 2022 when I'm filming this review for you these guys have produced 295 different kinds of beer and if you think that these guys were founded back in 2017 and we're just at the end of 2022 that's pretty much one beer every week there or thereabouts over the last five years so I have to say that is pretty damn good going but um, yeah that is all I can really tell you about um, uh, about Repubru for the moment Shoma Hata of course is quite a recognized name when within Japanese craft beer circles these days but yeah, I think we do need to get up to Numazu and have a little look at the, you know, the beer, the, the beer beer place. We need to go to West Coast Brewing as well, which is close by. And then there's Repub Brew. It seems to be a little bit of a beer hub, actually, in uh, in, Sh in Numazu and Shizuoka. And of course, it would be awesome to see Mount Fuji as well. But like I say, that's everything I can really tell you about Repub Brew for the moment. If you want to learn more about these guys, you can check out the brewery website. You can follow them on Facebook and Instagram to keep up to date with all the latest goings on. And you can, of course, check out the Rate Beer, Untapped and Beer Advocate pages to learn a little bit more about all the different beers that they've done. But yeah, let's get on and actually have a little look at the beer itself. So like I said to you earlier, this one is a 7.5% West Coast IPA and this one is an old school Sea Hop beer. So it's got Cascade, Citra, Columbus and Chinook in it. The Cascade in this one is from New Zealand. Uh, that seems to be quite a big thing in Japan, actually. A lot of the breweries that use Cascade use the New Zealand one instead of the American one must be a little bit cheaper or something like that but uh, yeah it is kind of interesting but as we know Cascade is about 8% alpha so it gives you a little bit of grapefruit a kind of nice sultani sort of thingy note as well um, Citra 14% alpha acid big mango notes uh, but also a little bit of a lemon limey kind of character in West Coast IPAs can also give you a bit of lychee and gooseberry as well in my experience but Columbus and Chinook are some of the classic bittering hops both about 14% alpha acid um, Chinook is going to give you that big strong grapefruity note uh, where uh, and also some big pine raisins but uh, Columbus is going to give you that more spicy floral character actually so um, yeah I think that's everything we need to say about the hops but like I said this is an old school sea hop west coast IPA but yeah I'll just let you have a little look at the artwork on the can before we open this one up but I have to say it does look pretty nice actually so uh, yeah it gets a big thumbs up from me just for the artwork alone. This one is quite unusual of course as well because it's a half litre can. The only other brewery I know that are doing this in Japan are at West Coast Brewing who are from very close by in uh, Mochi Muni if I remember the era correctly but that is just to the southwest of uh, Numazu. But there you can see plain silver top on the can there. It does look 
quite nice. Um, yeah, this beer I believe cost me 1,100 yen, so that's about $11 American, uh, about, what, 10 euros, maybe about nine pounds sterling. You know, craft beer is a little bit more expensive in Japan, but you know, it's a half liter can, it's a little bit more beer. That's just kind of how it goes. But yeah, I wanted to try this one. It was Rika's recommendation, why not? So let's get this guy out and we'll get on with the tasting them. The C-square IPA. I think I got a little bit on my ear there. <laughs> it went a bit crazy. Uh, the C-square IPA, 7.5% ABV from Rupabru in Numazu. She's woke up, yeah, should be quite nice. So I think that'll do for the moment while we have a look at the beer and the colour and things like that. And again, yeah, spilt a little bit on myself, but we've got about 75% of the beer out and into the glass at this point in time. So um, yeah, this looks quite interesting. So before the head disappears, I think we can say that this beer has poured with a half finger of a frothy, I would say kind of cream coloured head there. So you can see one or two, you've got some small bubbles on the surface there, a few kind of more medium sized ones going up toward the uh, the top of the head there, but it does certainly look quite nice. That is going to fade away to be a kind of thin foamy layer quite quickly though. But um, colour wise with this one, you can actually see it's more of a kind of medium amber and this beer actually does look a little bit more like a, a New England to be honest with you. Um, yeah, that's quite interesting. It's probably unfiltered, of course, you know, quite a, a number of West Coast IPAs can be filtered. But uh, yeah, the main one of the main differences between the West Coast and the New England would be that the West Coast IPAs tend to use only barley malt, whereas the, the New Englands use oats and wheat as well. It's not unheard of to use a little bit of wheat or a little bit of oat within a West Coast IPA. But uh, yeah, for the most part, they are uh, mainly barley malt. But I'm guessing the sort of haze that this beer has will be due to unfiltering potentially a little bit of wheat or um, or oat in there as well, though we have to keep that in mind. But um, yeah, it looks pretty interesting, this one. As I said, this one is a little bit more of a kind of slightly medium amber colour. So remember, the colour of your beer depends on one, the type of malts that you use. This goes a long way to, de to determining your EBC rating. Two, length of your wort boil is also going to play a role because the longer you boil the wort, the more the sugar is caramelised, thus you get a darker colour of beer. Any barrel aging that you do or any adjuncts that you put in will affect the colour of the beer as well. But when it comes to IPAs, you don't often have to care about that, actually. But in terms of a kind of modern IPA, there's nothing overly surprising about the appearance of this one. But when it said on the blurb that it was an old school kind of sea hop IPA, I was a little bit um, surprised that this one came out hazy uh, as it has so we'll just need to see what it what we have out of this one um, so yeah as I said the haze in this beer will be due to it being unfiltered or a little bit of wheat and oat and it, the yeast also of course can affect it too but uh, yeah appearance wise not what I expected I was expecting more of a an old school west coast IPA with this one so um, yeah should be good nonetheless though I've heard these beers are very nice and Rika of course does know our stuff. So let's have a wee look at the aroma of this one then and see what we've got. The only other thing we can say about this is that it doesn't have much in the way of visible carbonation. But let's do the nose and see what we have. Oh right, this is quite interesting. Yeah, I'm gonna say straight away, the nose on this beer is not madly pungent actually. Um. Aroma wise, yeah, aroma wise, this beer, it really doesn't jump out the glass at you, but it does have a little bit, when you put the your nose down into it, you will get a little bit more complexity out of it. Um, first impression of it though is that it's quite a wet and kind of a juicy leaning IPA, this one. It's a little bit hard to tell whether it's sort of West Coast or uh, you know, more of a kind of American type IP. I wonder if it will be one of these more American IPs, which is somewhere in the middle of the New England and the West Coast on the other side. Um, so yeah, if it is a West Coast, remember for me there are two different types of West Coast IPs that you can get. You get the more oily and caramelly ones, such as the Sierra Nevada Torpedo, or you get the more kind of bready and biscuity ones, such as the um, Pliny the Elder uh, from Russian River Brewing. Um, so yeah, aroma-wise, this one 
It actually reminds me of some of the IPAs I've had from Fierce Beer back home in Scotland. You know, these guys uh, just out of Dice um, to the northwest of Aberdeen. It's got a little bit of that, actually. Um, but an interesting aroma, a good little bit of breadiness, nice bit of green component, and also a bit more of an oily, fruity character. But I think we maybe have to term this one an American IPA rather than West Coast or New England. It isn't really distinctive enough in either regard to place it. But again, the style category is not the most important thing. The most important thing is whether the beer is good or not. But let's look at the aroma. So the backbone of this beer, it's absolutely got a little bit of a kind of fresh, white bready bread crust. That is the backbone. There's a little touch of woodiness in there. You've also got a good little bit of a wholemeal brown bready character. Um, definitely some white bread as well. So yeah, a little bit of white bread on top of that. The more that you smell this beer, it does lean a little bit more toward that kind of white bready sort of things. But within that white bread, I'm actually getting a little bit of a kind of... There was a sweet we had back in Scotland called... Um, Parma Violets, it just has a little bit of this candy sort of sherbet sort of thing going on. I do wonder if it could have a little bit of a sigillated malt in it. It reminds me of some of the old school uh, Magic Rock uh, IPAs actually. It's got a little bit of that going on. But as I say, bread crust, a little bit of woody character, wholemeal brown bread, white bread, and on top of that a little bit of that kind of acidulated malt, Parma Violet sort of things. But then you do get a little touch of a kind of caramelly uh, and brown sugary note out of this one so yeah a little bit of caramel a little bit of Werther's original we touch a McVitie's digestive biscuit um yeah but as I say the aroma of this beer is very the aroma of this beer really is quite mild actually um yeah but the malty side of things does shine through I think we can safely say that um on the hoppy side of the beer then the green component is quite um Again, it's quite relaxed in this beer. Um, I do wonder, I think this beer is going to rely on late addition and dry hopping, just from how pungent the green component is. You've got a little bit of earthiness in there. There is a little touch of herbal character, but it's quite a wet floral note and also quite a wet grassy character that I'm getting out of this one. Not too zesty or anything like that, but yeah, more wet, as I said. So remember, when it comes to uh, hopping your IPAs, there are three different things you can do. You can do early addition hopping within the first hour of your wort boil. That gives you mainly bitterness. You can do late addition hopping within the last half hour of your wort boil. Little touch of bitterness, but mainly flavour and aroma. And then you've got dry hopping, which comes after the wort boil, and that is all flavour and aroma. West Coast IPAs tend to use all three, whereas New England IPAs tend to rely on the latter two, sometimes with a little bit of early addition hopping. But for me, the green component in this beer doesn't come across as overly dank or deep, so that makes me think it is leaning more towards a late edition dry hopping um, kind of thing with this one. But the fruity side of the beer, I have to say, is quite um, is quite nice actually. So I'm surprised that we're not getting a bit more kind of spiciness from the Columbus and a, a bit more pininess from the Chinook actually. But again, that depends on when you actually add the hops. But yeah, you definitely have a little bit of this kind of sultana, uh, you know, dry white green grape note, a little bit of grapefruit from the um, from the Cascade as well. You've also got this kind of, um, there's definitely a little touch of juicy mango in this, which is going to be the citra. Um, but further forward on the nose, you get a bit of that gooseberry lychee sort of thing, which again will be the citra. And there's almost, I actually get quite a little bit of lemon out of this one, so... You know, I would have thought Centennial in this one. You say C square, you know, you think C hop Centennial is one of the old school ones as well. But the fruity note for me, for sure, a little bit of grapefruit, a little bit of passion fruit as well. The Sultana kind of peary notes from the Cascade. Good bit of mango. And then, yeah, a bit of lychee. A little bit of gooseberry and also a kind of lemony, uh, zesty kind of character too. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, the way this beer goes together I think is um, is really quite nice. Um, quite an interesting one for sure. It does remind me of uh, some of the Fierce Beer IPAs that I've had in recent times. As I always say though, take a bit of time to enjoy the aroma of the beer before you get stuck in. I think we spent quite a bit of time on this one though, so we should have a taste of this beer and see what it's all about. So yeah, this one is the Sea Square IPA, a 7.5% old school Sea Hop IPA from Repubru. In Shiz uh, Numazu in Shizuoka Prefecture, 
here in Japan. My first beer from these guys, Rika's recommendation. Let's get stuck in. Slanja, Skull, cheers. Oh, right. I'm going to say, this is quite interesting. Um, I'm pretty sure this is more. This is definitely an American IPA. First off, that's the first thing we can say about this. It is definitely like an, one of these beers that fits into the American IPA category. It's not overly New England. It's not overly West Coasty. It's somewhere in between. But I will say, that's a solid, solid beer, actually. It's a nice kind of... The first impression I have of it is that it's quite bready. But it's got a little bit of graininess, a little bit of juiciness in the fruit. Nice green component. The, the green component, incidentally, is bigger in the flavour than it is in the aroma. But then, yeah, you've also got the nice juicy characteristics as well. So, yeah, I like how this goes together. But, yeah... Uh, again, I'll say thank you to Rika for the recommendation with this one. She's uh, picked something pretty good for me, I have to say. Yeah. There we go. Um, yeah, I can see why she likes this one. It's quite a bready and juicy IPA, this one. But definitely, yeah, as I say, definitely one of these ones that fits into the American IPA category rather than being... New England or West Coast. It's got a little bit of both things going on here. So let's break this beer down and describe the flavour for you a little bit more in depth and see what we've got. So, um, middle of the palate with this beer then, middle third of your palate, you can feel that little bit of fresh kind of wholemeal brown bready bread crust, that forms the backbone of this beer. And that comes out a little bit more the further you go into the aftertaste. Further forward on the middle, further forward on the middle third of your tongue, there is a little touch of woodiness comes out of the beer. I'm getting quite a lot of woody flavours in my reviews these days actually. Maybe it's just because of the, maybe it's just something you, you get in the Japanese beers right enough. But yeah, there's definitely a little bit of a more kind of, um, there is a little touch of a woody um, character toward the front of that middle third of your palate. So yeah, bread crusty note. Yeah, definitely you've got a little bit of a kind of bread crusty note in there. Uh, a little bit of woody character further forward on the middle third of your tongue. Then above that, you start to get the kind of wholemeal brown bready character out of this one. Um, so yeah, we can't really, as I say, we can't really say, talk about the six elements of New England in this beer or the two different types of West Coast, because this is more of an American IP. It's something we should kind of consider uh, in its own context. Um, but yeah, above the whole meal brown bread, you start to get this nice kind of white bready layer. Um, I do get the impression with this beer, there could be a little bit of wheat, there could be a little bit of oat in this one. I think this one isn't. I just get the impression from the beer that it's not all barley malt, but as you can see, it's, it's quite clearly unfiltered as well. Quite a yeasty leaning beer too. And it does have a little bit of that kind of, you know, it does have a little bit of that kind of raw brew pub type feel to it, actually. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's interesting, this one. So above that kind of wholemeal brown bready layer, uh, there is a little touch of Jacob's Cream Cracker coming out of it. Some nice kind of fluffy white bread as well. And, um, yeah, it does go together nicely. So yeah, fluffy white bread in there. The further you go into the aftertaste with that, you actually get a little bit of an almost kind of sweet character out of the bread, which is interesting. But yeah, bread crust, a little bit of woodiness, kind of Jacob's cream cracker, wholemeal brown bread, white bread. There is maybe a little touch of wheatiness in there, smoothing in the beer out. But above that, you start to get some of the more kind of sweet malty characters out of the beer. So in the dead centre of your palate, you've got a little touch of that kind of Werther's original butter candy, butterscotchy sort of thing. And as you move out toward the edges 
uh, of that middle third of your palate, you get a little bit of a more kind of McVitie's digestive biscuity sort of thing as well. So um, yeah, the way this beer goes together, I think, is very, very nice in that regard. The middle third of your palate is, um, is really nicely done. Yeah, quite an, as I say, quite an interesting one. A uh, little bit of New England, a little bit of West Coast with the brown sugars and the biscuit and stuff like that, and the bread. But yeah, still, whatever category, whatever box you want to put this beer in, it is quite nice. But let's focus on the back third of your palate then. So the border region between middle and back third of your palate, you get a little bit of a kind of, you get a little bit of bready build up in there. Um, so you can feel that. It's kind of like a white bread actually, but the base of the back third of your palate, a little bit of a more, yeah, the base of the back third of your palate, you've got a nice little bit of a more kind of grainy bread crusty note. Above that, you've got a more kind of crackery character. So yeah, definitely a little bit of crackeriness there. Then you've got the wholemeal brown bready layer, which is definitely taller and slightly more airy than the white bready layer as well, which again is taller and more airy. And then above all of that, you do have a more kind of airy, yeasty sort of character with this one. There's something very familiar about this beer. I, I get a feeling a lot of the flavours within the malt base, a lot of the breadiness and stuff in this beer, I think, is coming from the yeast. Um, and could it? I don't think it is. I don't think it's USO five, but I think it is um, a yeast strain that I've had before. There is just something very familiar about this one. But above that white bready layer on the back third of your palate, you can feel there is this more airy, light, kind of um, farmhousey bready character in there. It's got a little touch of honeycomb to it, a little bit of a woody note as well. But yeah, the, the this beer, the more that I drink of this one, the more I would say it's quite a yeasty leaning American IPA. So uh, yeah, interesting stuff. But yeah, back third of your palate, you can feel the flavour is taller. And as you come further forward into the middle third of your palate, it just squashes down and condenses together. Let's go on to the hoppy side of this beer then. So, back corners of your palate. Yeah. There's a little bit of earthiness there, but not a lot. As you come further forward though, you can feel the beer does have a little bit of a kind of piney resin to it, which will be the Chinook. And as you reach the front corners of the palate, it's got a little touch of spice to it as well, which will be, which is the, the Columbus. So yeah, the way that this beer, uh, goes together, I think is um, I the way that this beer goes together in that sense is quite nice. As I said earlier, I'm pretty sure this beer is leaning toward late edition and dry hopping rather than early edition hops. But yeah, nice kind of pine resin resiny characters in there, a little bit of floral aromaticity. So it's not overly spicy, which I would expect more of that from the Columbus, to be honest with you. Columbus is a very spicy, um, kind of dry spicy hop, actually. But yeah, the pine raisins in there, a little bit of spicy character. And then round the front curve of your palate, you've got a wee bit of a more kind of light and grassy sort of note in there. So yeah, lighter grassy character, a little bit of zestiness. But the grassy side of this beer around the front curve of your tongue is a little bit wetter. So definitely need to bear that in mind. Let's look at the front third of your palate. So, front third of your palate in this beer. Um, the border region between front third and middle third of your palate, again, you get a little bit of a white bready build up in there. Yeah, a little bit of white bready build up. The base of the front third of your palate, you've got a little touch of bread crust, wee bit of brown bread, but then yeah, again more white bready. And above that you've got that nice oily bubble where the juicy fruity esters just roll their way out of the beer. So for me, you're getting the Cascade and the Citra out of this one. And also the, the, the Chinook is playing a role here as well. Like at the back of that front third of your palate, there's definitely a strong, a, a, slight, a bit of that slightly stronger grapefruit. Then as you move further forward, a bit more of a mellow passion fruit. And then you also have... Um, you've also got a little bit of that more, um, yeah, you've got a little bit of a kind of mangoey note to it as well. So yeah, grapefruit, passion fruit, more juicy mango, one or two little apricot notes underneath, a little bit of papaya. Um, yeah, the way that this beer goes together in that sense 
is um, is really quite nice. The tropical side of this beer, I really quite like actually, and that's going to be coming mainly from the citra. Um, the further you go into the aftertaste with this one, it's quite interesting because I actually get in the base of that back, the the, the back of that front third of your palate, there's a little bit of a more, how do we say, a bit of gas off this beer. Um, it has got a little bit of that more kind of sultana, you know, dry white green grapey character, which is going to come from the Cascade. But as you move further forward onto the front half of that front third of your palate, there's a little bit of lemon limey character, there's a little bit of lychee, gooseberry, and yeah, a bit of that, that more oily peary character. So the oily peary will come from the Cascade, I would say. But then, yeah, the sort of lemon limey and lychee notes will come from the Citra. Um, so this beer... The way it goes together is just, it's really nice. It has a little bit of that raw kind of um, brew pub, home brew type vibe to it. But there's just something very, very familiar about it. But it gets a big thumbs up from me regardless. I think this is a, a nicely done beer. And I can see why Rika recommended it to me. It's something a little bit different. But it's also really quite enjoyable. But most definitely, flav flavour profile wise, it is an American IP. It's got the big breadiness and a bit of the biscuitiness from the West Coast side of things. But, you know, the kind of smoothness and stuff that this beer has and the yeastiness is a little bit more New England. So I think American IPA is the best category that we can put this beer into. So, yeah, really just, yeah, just enjoyable beer, this one. It does remind me, as I say, of some of the fierce beer IPAs and paleos that I've had over the years. Um, but yeah, mouthfeel wise then, mid-bodied beer, the carbonation is very, very smooth. It's got a bit of a creamy mouthfeel to it in fairness, but at the same time it's kind of quite oily. IBU wise, I think this is a sort of 30, 40 IBU affair. The malt base, as I said, a little bit of graininess, a little bit of smoothness, good little bit of sweetness. Um, and then yeah, you've also got that sort of juicy and slightly oily, fruity character to it as well. So yeah, the way this beer goes about its business I think is very nice. That's one of my catchphrases of course, the way the beer goes about its business. But uh, yeah, it has this kind of raw, home-brewed, brew pubby type uh, feel to it. And there's a lot of things about this beer that are familiar. The old school sea hops of course are, uh, are always a nice uh, change of pace for me. But yeah, I think this, is, this has been a really nice review and I'm quite happy with this beer. So it certainly makes me want to try a few more from Repubru. I think we can say that for sure. But yeah, I think that's about everything that we need to say about this beer. Quite a bready and mix, you know, kind of smooth, slightly creamy uh, American IP. I think that's a good way to describe the mouthfeel, to be honest with you. But uh, yeah, this was the C Square IPA, 7.5% ABV, definitely an American IPA stylistically from um, Repubru in Numazu in Shizuoka Prefecture here in Japan. I'm going to go away and enjoy the rest of this. A little bit tired at this point in time, so yeah, that's why you get the slightly longer review and a little bit of rambling, I have to say. But yeah, impressed with this one and I will be looking at more beers from these guys at some point in the future. But yeah, until the next time, please like, subscribe, share, all the usual YouTube stuff. Let me know your own thoughts on this beer in the comment section below. Let me know what your favourite beers are from Repubru as well. I think we will need to try something from the darker side of the spectrum next time round though. But yeah, C Square IPA, 7.5% ABV from Repubru in Numazu, Shizuoka Prefecture here in Japan. Big thank you to Rika for the recommendation at Liquor Shop Asahi. Check them out and I'll see you guys in the next review. Slanjit, Skull, cheers, Kampai.